<laughs> Thank you, Karen. Isn't it great to have Tommy and Karen with us today? Amen. Amen. I understand they were here at the women's conference yesterday, and somebody said they can't come to that without staying to be here today. So thank you all for that. I failed earlier today, and I apologize for that, to ask for those of us who have prayer concerns, please let them be raising your hand. And I know we have many, many, many prayer concerns as a church family. Again, I appreciate your ongoing prayers for me. Um, if you wouldn't mind whispering a prayer right now, that God give me the strength to do what he's called me to do this day. I, um, um, I just thank God, amen, that he's allowed us to be here. Some of us aren't feeling that well, but uh, uh, he's given us what we need. Amen, he's given us what we need. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to John. We're going to be looking our focals in John chapter 8, just one verse, John chapter 8, verse 12. We're going to be looking at some of the pieces, if you would, of uh, John chapter 7, some of the select verses there, as well as John chapter 8, really to kind of set the context. This, this is a sermon series I began uh, a few weeks back, and of course I've missed the last two Sundays. Again, I want to thank Jamie for filling in for me, but... Uh, talking about the, the I am sayings of Jesus and the controversial at the time I am sayings of Jesus. There are seven of those found in the Gospel of John. Each time Jesus asserts unto himself the characteristics of God in these I am sayings, it's not by accident. It's not by accident. Jesus was very intentional about this and using the opportunities and, and uh, he, he ascribes that unto himself. If you recall that, that uh, in the introduction sermon the, in, in chapter 8, the latter portion of chapter 8, uh, Jesus made the, just an astounding statement before Abraham was, I am. I am. And it was outraged uh, people in the crowd, particularly the, the religious, religious elite of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They wanted to stone him to death. They considered to be blasphemy. But there are seven other occasions, you know, where, where Jesus not only says, uses the words, I am, but he says, I am, the last time we talked was, I am the bread of life. Today is going to be, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. We'll see that in John chapter 8, verse 12. One of the things about each of these seven sayings and, and uh, if you look at the Greek, the original language of the New Testament the words I am that we have in our English version, the Greek is ego ami. Two words, ego ami. Ego, E-G-O, as we transliterate it, means I. The ami, E-I-M-I, means I am. I, I am. Ego ami, I, I am. Jesus is being very emphatic. When he says these things, he's saying, I, I am the bread of life. I, I am the light of the world. I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, Jesus is saying, me. Nobody else but me. Nobody else but me. Today we're going to look at that. I am the light of the world. I want to give you a little bit of context. This goes back to the beginning of chapter 7, of where we're at, to kind of set the stage when he says in, in chapter 8 that I'm the light of the world. If you go back to chapter 7, the early verses of chapter 7, you'll see that in Jerusalem, they're celebrating what's known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, depending on what your translation is. This is a, a annual Tradition. It was an annual uh, celebration, an annual feast that was required of the mosaic, mosaic law, uh, in the Mosaic Law for the adult men of all Israel, all 12 tribes, to come once a year to Jerusalem and celebrate this. Some of the women came too, but it was required of the men. And what they would do is they'd, they'd erect temporary structures. They'd take tree branches and palm leaves and such like that and build little small, very uh, simple structures to live in during this seven-day 
festival that went on in Jerusalem once a year. It was a time of great rejoicing. And, and, and all the males that would come into the city. And they, they, so you'd have all these booths or these little tabernacles set up all around Jerusalem where the men, that would be their shelter, that would be where they would stay, where they would sleep during this week-long series of events known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. During this time in the temple, there would be special sacrifices offered on, on each of the days. And it would reach a climax on the last day, the, the great day of the feast, when the, when the people would, could finally leave their, their temporary shelters, their booths, for this final celebration. And this, go, this reflects back to the period of the Exodus, when they were living in temporary shelters for 40 years until they reached the promised land and could establish homes and, 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 and plots of land to, to, to raise their families on. During this feast, there were two very important events that took place. Among the others, these two were the most significant. One was this great procession where the priest would lead the way from the temple down to the pool of Siloam outside the temple and collect water. they take that water and ceremonially carry it back to the temple through what was known as the water gate. And they would pour that water out. And again, this harkens back to the Exodus period. It was a reminder of, of Yahweh's provision, of God's provision, of the Lord's provision of water during the Exodus, at particularly Exodus chapter 17, when the children of Israel cried out to Moses, saying, have you brought us from, from, from Egypt out here just so we could perish of thirst in the desert? And how God provided that water. And, and, they, and, they, and the, when they did that, when they brought this water up from the pool of Siloam through the water grate into the temple and poured it out, in John chapter 7, this is when Jesus says in, in verse 37, you know, on this last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from this innermost from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So Jesus is taking the opportunity to, to talk about the events that are going on and then equating that to himself. That they had in mind where God provided this water so that they could live. And now God has provided the living water. Amen? The living water. So, and again, Jesus, it, when, when he does that or did that, it was, it was very controversial. It was very controversial. It was not, uh, it, it didn't sit well among the religious elite. Uh, again, he was claiming to be the very one who they were celebrating that day. And, and, and we see in, in, in John chapter 7, verses 40 through 44, how, how people are, are, it's mixed reactions. You know, all these people in Israel, some were saying, is, is, is this a prophet? Some were saying, is this the Christ? Others are saying, well, well, if it's the Christ, surely he didn't come from Galilee. This can't be the Christ. And, and etc. And there was a big division because of him. And verse 44 says that some of them even wanted to take Jesus and seize him because, again, they consider him to be doing blasphemy during this. Now, again, this is the festival, this great festival of the, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. And the central location of all this, the focal point, is the temple of God. The temple of God. And, uh, again, this lasted for seven days, for a week. Now, one of the things they do during this, you know, the temple is the structure, and inside the temple was the, the Holy of Holies, which is where the, the Ark of the Covenant would have been, and, and where the chief priest on once a year would go in to, to give a sacrifice for the people, the Holy of Holies, and just the chief priest once a year. Outside of that in the structure was the, the holy place where only the, the tr chiefs on their rotation could come in and offer certain things such as the, the, the uh, grain offerings, etc. inside the holy place. And outside of that was the court of the men. And then beyond that was the court of the women. And beyond that was the court of the Gentiles. And the temple sat at the high point of Jerusalem, up on top of, of the mount. 
Well, during this period, during this festival, they had four gigantic candelabras. You know what a candelabra is? It's that Jewish lamp with the four candles on the top of it. They had these huge candelabra, four of those they set out there in the court of the women to provide light for all the festivities going on in the temple around this Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths. And, and the men would rejoice all night. There'd be singing and celebration and then singing of hymns and psalms, etc. And those four candelabra would, could be seen. They wouldn't necessarily illuminate all Jerusalem, but they could be seen from Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem, perhaps even miles away. They could see this great light up there in the house of God. That's where Jesus comes in. In Jesus, in John chapter 8, verse 12, when the focal point is, and when a lot of people are focusing on these great lights, these candelabra where the temple is lit up, in John chapter 8, verse 12, our focal passage, Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen? Amen? So again, this is Jesus taking unto himself and claiming to have some of the very nature and characteristics of God. And why not? Jesus is God. Amen? Jesus is God. But the uniqueness of this claim, Jesus says, I am the light. I am the light. It's an audacious claim. It, 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 it's a very boastful claim in a lot of people's words. It, it, in other words, Jesus is saying that he is nothing less than divine. He's nothing less than divine. And you can imagine the uproar that would cause among people. They, many of those, had, most of them, had not, did, did not believe he was the Son of God. They did not accept the fact that he was the Messiah. He was rejected among his own people. But he's saying that he's nothing less than divine. Again, this is during the festival of Tabernacle or Booths, which celebrated the time of Exodus. Now, you remember how God led his people during the Exodus? A cloud by day and what by night? A pillar of fire to light the way. Jesus here is looking at these candelabras lighting up the temple and saying that he's the light of the world. And reflecting back, he's also reflecting and saying, you remember that light by which your forefathers were led from Egypt? I am that light. I am that light. It's a very audacious claim. It's a unique claim. But it's also a universal claim. Because Jesus didn't just say, I am the light. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Back during the Exodus, that pillar of fire by night led the children of Israel. And only the children of Israel. It didn't lead anybody else. But Jesus now is saying that this applies to everybody. I'm the light not just of the Jewish people, not just of the descendants of David, not just to the, the, the children of Abraham. I am the light of the whole world. In other words, he's claiming to be greater than all religious leaders. He's claiming to be greater than all of the gods that were worshipped that day or any other day. He was not simply just a prophet to the Jews. His claim was universal. He's the, he's the, the light of the world. See, one thing we know is that there are a lot of religions out there. And, and there's only one religion that leads to God. Amen? And that's the religion that's around the, the truth of His Son. There's only one way, and Jesus is it. Amen? But he, so he has this unique claim that he's the light. He has this universal claim that he's the light of the world. He has this really un, unambiguous claim that whoever follows him, whoever follows him will have the light.
the, the, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's a very refreshing claim. It's a very simple claim. It's, 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 it's not a, there's no religious, you know, fancy talk here. There's no qualifications required. There's, there's no fudging. There's no wiggle room. The promise is crystal clear. Whoever follows him. He says, whoever follows me. That makes it simple, doesn't it? It makes it simple. We try to complicate it so much. So many times we're afraid to tell people about Jesus because we think the gospel message is too complicated. We'll get it all wrong. But there's nothing complicated about it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. Whoever follows him. When I was preparing this sermon, I reflected back to when I had kind of a taste of that. Several years ago, as I was going through my doctorate studies, I had a particular class I, was, I had to take, and I was sitting in that class for several days, and my class is a very diverse setting in terms of the, the students that took part in that class. It was a small class. There's only seven students. I was one of the seven, and we had one professor. Let me, here's the makeup of that class. One of those students was from China. His name is Lee, L-I. Another student was a pastor from northern India. He went by the name of Daniel. And India, by the way, there's 1.2 billion people. Most of those are Hindu. But he's a Christian pastor. One was a missionary that was, on home, that was home on furlough from Ukraine. And our professor, Bill Taylor, William, quote, Bill Taylor, was a longtime missionary to South America. And at the time, he was serving as an officer with the World Evangelism Association. And part of the thing about that class was we got to exchange stories of our ministries and our encounters with God and how God had worked in such mighty ways. Let me tell you about one of those people. I mentioned that one of the students was a, a pastor from India by the name of Lee. And he was not just a pastor, not from India, from China, from China. He was not just a pastor in China, but he was also one that was training other pastors in China. Now, you know China is a very oppressive nation. You know that in China, we've even seen stories recently about how the Chinese authorities have gone in and torn down church buildings because they didn't like what's being taught in China. The church in China is largely an underground church, meaning it's a hidden church. It's a secret church. And the church in China, by the way, is one of the fastest growing churches in the world because the Christians are standing firm to the oppression. Pastor Lee had been in prison before I met him in class. And, he, and many of his co-workers and friends and family had been imprisoned by the Chinese. The China, though the church is in many ways persecuted, it's one of the fastest growing churches in, America, in, in the world. It is estimated that in China, there are as many as 200 million Christians in China. There are more Christians in China than there are in America. Because just like in the book of Acts, when the church is really faced with persecution, the church grows dramatically. Grows dramatically. Don't get me wrong, I'm not praying for persecution in America any more than what we have. But if it were to happen, I believe God would be glorified in a mighty way because his church would explode with people coming to faith in Christ. Lee from China, that pastor, was running a seminary. And we found out while he was in class in America, the authorities discovered that seminary. 
and had gone in and arrested all the students and the professors, shut down the seminary and threw them in prison. See, Jesus is the light of the world. Lee had seen darkness. Lee was living in darkness. But Lee's life was not defined by the darkness around him. His life was defined by his faith in Jesus, the light of the world. Amen? So those people in China and other places, they're walking in the light even though they're surrounded by darkness. Jesus says, He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. That is an ultimate claim. That's a, a definitive claim there. Never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. All of that's kind of background to give you four brief points here. We'll wrap it up. If you're in the habit of taking notes, there's four points I'd like to, to give you this day. Point number one, where the light shines, there can be no darkness. Amen? Where the light shines, there can be no darkness. On a recent Wednesday, I told this same illustration. It was appropriate then as it is now. I'm going to share with you today. Some of you have heard this, a few of you that attend on Wednesdays. But... When I was back in the latter part of my naval career, the late 1990s, we were stationed in, in, in the submarine base of Kings Bay, Georgia. I was teaching a co-ed Sunday school class uh, at First Baptist Church of Kingsland, Georgia. And I, I don't remember exactly what the lesson was about, but it had to do with the light and dark. The light and dark. So I wanted to, to show them the difference between light and dark. Now, Kingsland's a small town, probably roughly the same size of our, of maybe Anderson, something like that, maybe a little bit smaller than Anderson, but, but it's fairly small geographically speaking in terms of area. So I, one Saturday night, I decided I wanted to have this illustration to show my students in my Sunday school class the next morning about lightness, light and darkness. So I took a, a big, it's probably about a gallon glass jar, and I took that thing, I took duct tape and put a couple of layers of duct tape all I had a, a, a screw on cap on the top of it but I, took, I duct taped that light that, that glass jar so that no light could penetrate no light could get in no light could get out and I, I took that jar and the lid and I drove outside the city limits I drove down this country road and I got to this spot where there was no interference from the city lights it was a cloudy night, so you couldn't see the moon or the stars. It was away from everything, so in other words, if I was to turn off the headlights on my car, it'd be completely dark. And it was. I found this spot. I pulled off the road next to this field. Had a little embankment. You went over to the field. I, I had a little flashlight with me. I took that. I turned off my car, turned off the lights, took that flashlight, and went walking up through this field with that jar with me. And when it got into that field, I turned the flashlight off, and sure enough, it was so dark I couldn't see anything. So I took that glass jar that I taped up with duct tape, and I took that jar and scooped up as much darkness as I could. Amen? I scooped up that darkness, and then I, I screwed on the lid on that jar as tight as I could. I was satisfied. I said, now I've got my illustration. I turned my flashlight back on, went back to my, my vehicle and made my way back, back to the house. The next morning, it's time for Sunday school. We're having this illustration about light and dark, and I wanted to show them what darkness was. So I, I gather all the class around. There's probably 15, 20, 25 of us in that class that day, and I said, I want you all to get where you all can see this. And I took that jar and I, I, and I taped up and put all that darkness inside. I took off the lid of that jar. And what did they, what did they see? And the inside of a jar. There's no darkness left. Well, why was there no darkness left? Did it leak out overnight? Did, did, did it decay overnight? No. The illustration ended up being perfect. Because darkness did not leak out, 
light got in. Amen? So wherever there is light, there can be no darkness. Amen? Darkness, scientifically, is simply the absence of light. Darkness, spiritually, is simply the absence of the light. Amen? So where the light shines, there can be no darkness. Point number two, to live in the light, we must follow the light. To live in the light, we must follow the light. Jesus says there in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. He doesn't say if you're born of a certain pedigree or if you attend a certain church or if you're involved in a certain ministry, all that's well and good, but he says you must follow him. Amen? To live in the light, you must follow the light. Point number three, we are either drawn to the light or we're repelled by it. Amen? We're either drawn to the light or we're repelled by it. You can kind of think of us as a bunch of bugs. There are two kind of bugs when it comes to this. How many of y'all turn on your porch light and all these bugs come? Amen? How many of y'all go and turn on a, a light and all the roaches scatter? I'm not going to go around categorizing who's who. But we're either drawn to the light or we're repelled by it. Same thing with mankind. There is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. You can't walk the fence, straddle the line. You are either a follower of Christ or you are not. If you're a follower of Christ, you'll live in the light and you'll have eternal life. If you don't follow Christ, you will live in the darkness and you will die a sinner's death. Amen. Amen. So we are either drawn to the light or we're repelled by it. And then finally, if we live in the light, that means we also must reflect the light. We must reflect the light. An image of anything. If you're looking around right now at this room, you may be looking at one of these beautiful stained glass windows. You may be looking at one of the chandeliers or the spotlights or the piano or at me or at your neighbor. What you are seeing simply is a reflection of the light that's coming back. The, the lens of your eyes is interpreting that light and that, that image is being formed in your mind because of the light that's come to you about the reflecting off of that image you're looking at. The question is, is our image also a reflection of Christ? Is our image also a reflection of Christ? We need to represent Christ to the world. When people see us, they need to see an image of Christ. Oh, none of us look like Jesus physically. Some of us may be close with our beards or long hair or whatnot. and We can dress up and try to approximate what Jesus looked like, but that's not the point. The point is not to be how Jesus looked, but to be how Jesus lived. Amen? So again, the question is, do we reflect the light of Christ and how it is we choose to live our lives. Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life.